Yeah, interesting what's going on in the news, um, isn't it? You know, it's uh, serious times, but we shouldn't fear. You know, these things should get us, um, what, want us to prepare even more for, for um, Yeshua, who's coming back soon. Um, so with that, we will, uh, we'll start, we'll get into it. We'll get into the Torah portion um, this week, um, which is Pehu Day. Torah portion, Pehu Day, and it's the last Parsha in the Book of Exodus now. So it's the last little bit of chunk out of the book of Exodus, and it's from chapters um, Exodus 38 to verse 21, and we go all the way to the end this week. Um, so if you can all open your Bibles, and that's to Exodus chapter 38, verse 21, or Shemot, as we like to call it. We like to look at the Hebrew in this room, don't we? We like to find the hidden gems in the Hebrew, and I hope to bring some of these today as well, what, what we see in the Word. So I'll let you all get to it, and as you're finding that, as always, we're going to read out the Almond House Creed um, because we can love the Hebrew all we want. We can love the, the, the knowledge all we want, but we've got to keep love foremost in, in our walk and in our life. So um, we'll read the Almond House Creed. It's from 1 Corinthians 13, and it says, Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not boast. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave indecently. Does not seek its own is not provoked, reckons not the evil. Love does not rejoice over the unrighteousness, but rejoices in the truth. Love covers all, believes all, expects all, endures all. Love never fails. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So Torah portion, uh, Pehu Day. And the meaning in English is accounts, accounts. So Tommy, as always, is going to give us a little bit of insight on what, on, on, a bit more to what Peku Day means before we get into the, the Parsha in a nutshell. Um, but yeah, it's quite sad, really, because the last Parsha in Exodus, what a book it's been. Um, yeah, it's been such an amazing book, but, but we've still got two, uh, three more to go, three books to go. Um, so with that, we'll, we'll um, have a little look at what Peku Day means. Yeah. Nice one, Jack. Um, yeah, it's... Um... Yeah, like you said, it's the last part in the uh, the Book of Shemot. Yeah, come on, quick. And it's, it's funny because um, we've been reading about the tabernacle, and it's, uh, its components, etc. That takes up almost half of the Book of Exodus. It's um, it shows that it's important yeah. and the significance of it. You know, there's a real a message in that, isn't it? Alone that it should take such a portion of one book. Yeah. Uh, such as the significance of it, and it's nice to be able to look into and to delve into what is the significance of it, you know, which we've tried to do. Yeah, so Peku Day, the last part in the Shemot and Exodus. It's a funny word, this Peku Day. Um, it comes from the root word Pachad, and that can mean different things. If anyone knows other languages, there's certain words that can have so many meanings, and there's a verb in Spanish for anyone who speaks Spanish. And our sister Bree does her name, Viviana. And there's a, a verb in Spanish called echa. And it can just mean so many things. And out of context, you, you could really, it could be like an insult. So it's one of these words, Peki Day, coming from the root word Pacad. It, it has to be read and understood within context for its true meaning to come out, you know. Um, and as you said, brother, it means accounts. It can also mean things like musterings, uh, countings, expenses, appointments, uh, records, assignments. It can even mean a visit. You know, it's quite a varied range of uh, meanings it's got. But we have to keep things in context. And here, within the context, it means accounts. Um, the first time we come across this root word for Peku Day, which is Pakad, is actually back in Genesis when God visited Sarah. Um, it's not any kind of visit where you just turn up and say, do you fancy a cup of tea? It's a, it's a serious visit, it's a visitation, it's a, something with a purpose. Mm. It usually involves making sure that everything's in order, how it should be. Interesting. You know, and what, what is interesting, bro, is that the, um, the last part was via hell. And it's and he gathers or and he assembles and the very next one is accounts. Wow. And we all know we read it in Matthew, we read it in Romans, that one day we will have a visitation with the most high and give account of ourselves. Mm, wow. So it's about accountability, you know. Wow. 
Um, it's a small tree, but I'm sure you're going to un unravel things. But um, yeah, that's the from the rootway of Pachad. That's Pechu Day. Wow, yeah. Well, thanks, brother. It's quite interesting, really, because this uh, Pechu Day, the Torah portion, it usually gets a, a doubled up each year, doesn't it? Yeah. With, with the previous one. Yes. So when you put them two titles together, it makes sense, doesn't he it? He assembled accounts. He assembled accounts, yeah. Wow. Are wow. you in order? Yeah, yeah. Have you contributed to the tabernacle <laughs> or to yourself? Yeah, basically. Yeah, wow, yeah. wow. Interesting. So we've got the Parsha in a nutshell. In this week's Torah portion, a count is made of the precious metals donated for the use in the construction of the ta tabernacle. Gold, silver and bronze. The craftsmen, Betzalel, Aholiab, and their assistants complete the priestly garments exactly as Yahuwah had specified to Moses. The production of the individual components of the tabernacle is completed and they are brought together, constructed and raised in the presence of Moses, who proceeds to bless and anoint it with the holy anointing oil. Moses proceeds to bless and anoint Aaron and his sons, officially appointing them as the priesthood. Following this, a cloud descends on the tabernacle and Moses is told he cannot enter God's presence presence uh, because it has filled the tent. Uh, sorry, he cannot enter the tent because his presence has filled the tent. The cloud becomes the beacon for the children of Israel during the day and a column of fire by night, knowing that its presence signifies that God is with them and its moves signifies that they must pack up, camp and move on. So we get the completion of the tabernacle this week. We've been looking at it for a few weeks now, haven't we? All the different components. What did he mean? How did he relate to our Messiah, Jesus, Yeshua? So this week we're going to, funny enough, the, some of the equipment does come up again. Um, but in, in, more, in, in a more way of um, the gold and the silver and the bronze is, is, is accounted for this week. So we're going to have a little look at that. And it's only two and a half chapters, like I said, because... It's usually paired up with Pechudai, but for whatever reason, on the calendar this year, it with was uh, yeah with Vayachel. It's just it's just the single. Um, so the previous weeks, what we've been looking at again is, is is all these different components. We went into the materials and how some of these materials are really rare and have healing qualities, and, and they're almost divine in, in themselves, aren't they? The gold, the silver, um, how how they can heal and 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 and, and, and um, cast out death in a sense. So. What we're going to be doing is this week, um, we're just going to be reading just up to chapters. Um, let's have a look. We'll just do to the end of 38. This is the inventory of the tabernacle, the tabernacle of testimony, which was counted according to the commandments of Moses for the service of the Levites by the hand of Ithamar, son of Aaron the priest. Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, made all that the Lord had commanded Moses. And with him was Aholiab, the son of Ahisamach of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and designer, a weaver of blue, purple and scarlet thread, and of fine linen. Yeah. All the gold that was used in all the work of the holy place, that is, the gold of the offering, was 29 talents and 730 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. And the silver from those who were numbered of the congregation was 100 talents, and 1,775 shekels, according to the shekel of the sanctuary. A becha for each man, that is, half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for everyone included in the numbering from 20 years old and above, for 603,550 men. And from the hundred talents of silver were cast the sockets of the sanctuary and the bases of the veil, 100 sockets from the hundred talents, one talent for each socket, then from the 1,775 shekels, he made hooks for the pillars, overlaid their capitals and made bands for them. The offering of bronze was 70 talents and 2,400 shekels. And with it, he made the sockets for the door of the tabernacle of meeting, the bronze altar, the bronze grating for it, and all the utensils for the altar, the sockets for the court all around, the bases for the court gate, all the pegs for the tabernacle, and all the pegs with the court all around. Wow. Wow, thanks, brother. So again, another little bit of a shopping list. We've got um, some um, measurements going on here, or some, some weights. And, you know, what is this? This is the inventory of the tabernacle of, of all the shekels and the talents. And when you read that, you, you know, we, we're not used to dealing with shekels and talents, so you, you can get a bit lost in it, really. 
So I've just done a little calculation on how much that will be in today's money. Um, so, you know, what is a shekel and a talent? You know, they are measurements of weight used for currency. That's what they was back in the day. And um, they didn't have paper money. You would weigh out different silver and gold and you would use that, use that to trade goods. And most commonly what was used to trade was silver. As we know, if we read in Genesis, um, Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver, um, wasn't he? So silver was, was one of the most um, used, used precious metals for currency. And in this part, in this verse, in one of the verses here, we've got in verse 25 to 26, we can actually figure out the relationship of a shekel to a talent. And 3,000 shekels equates to one talent. So this is some estimate, um, an estimate of what it's worth in today's money. And this is converting um, the gold into tons and then seeing what it's worth on the market. Now, bear in mind, th this, this price is what it's worth today. We've got all these different types of machinery to be able to dig up gold. And, and, and you've got to imagine over the years how much gold has been brought, you know, has been mined up. But back then, it probably was even more than this. And I've got here that the gold that, that was mentioned for the tabernacle and all the equipment, it was 36 million pounds worth in today's money. And for the for the... Um, US listeners, that's $50 um, million dollars, uh, worth of gold that was used to construct the tabernacle. And when you think about it, some of these items, as we was looking at the other week, the ark itself was only two and a half cubits long, which was about this wide. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, a lot, it's a, lot of, um, a lot of money when you put it in that perspective. And again, is this the exact amount of money? Because we're talking back then when gold might have been a bit more precious, who knows? And then the silver, if we add up all the, all the shekels of silver, it equates to uh, one uh, one point six million uh, pounds or two million dollars, and then bronze was fourteen thousand pounds or nineteen thousand dollars. So there was a lot of money, over fifty million dollars um, worth, uh, went into putting in this uh, into this tabernacle. And you know, you could say, you know, uh, that's quite interesting. You know, how 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 could the Israelites these these people living in the desert have all this money? Well, we know, don't we, that when the Israelites came out of Egypt, they actually came out as a wealthy nation. And um, we read in Exodus in, in chapter 12, verse 35, it says um, that they, they acquired possessions from the Egyptians. Um, it says, and that the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians so that they granted them what they requested. And that was silver and gold and clothes and other articles. So they come out a rich nation. A nation was born when, when uh, the Passover took place. And, you know, in a sense, you know, talk about a royal king that we saved. You know, this, this is royalty, isn't it, when you put it in perspective? Um, it's so much money, so much precious metals that was going into making this, um, to, to making this tabernacle. And it's quite funny because the past couple of weeks, me and Joe have been, um, you know, just joking with each other and just having a good laugh because a few people have joined the fellowship. And when you first join the fellowship or you come into the faith, it's like you're rich. You know, you're walking around, you've got a smile on your face. Hallelujah. You, it looks like you've just come out of Egypt, yeah. out of bondage. <laughs> and, and, and I was reading this Torah portion. I was like, 50 million? Wow, I'm looking around the room and some people look like they just won the lottery for 50 million <laughs> when they meet the most high. And it's just... You know, just that parallel of, of, of the spiritual, uh, the physical bondage they was in, they come away, there was a wealthy nation, us in a spiritual bondage, we come away and we're rich mm -hmm. spiritually. So it's just, just a beautiful parallel there. And um, you could think, oh, is that harsh? You know, they plundered the Egyptians there. Um, but what you've got to remind, remind yourself in the narrative is that he was actually in bondage and slavery. And many scholars say um, that, that, that he was owed the money what for all that time that he was in bondage and our, our god is a god of justice so it's like he's paid he's paid the money back what he was owned and then some um yeah so so was you going to say something brother yeah just on that just touching on that where it says um they plundered the egyptians yeah that's the version we get most commonly but um when you look into the source of the word we actually it, it says we we ransomed them mm. Yeah. So he said, as you said, God is a God of justice. Mm. He allowed the Egyptians to be ransomed because yeah. they had to pay what they owed. Yeah. So we actually, it says, plundered them, but we actually ransomed them. Yeah. You know? And yeah. they didn't care for the plagues, for the harsh Exactly. Punishment they were ransomed. The Israelites yeah. through. Uh -huh. And in a sense, they were saying, like, look, please just leave Egypt. I'll, I'll pay you anything. Get out of here. Look what's happening. You know, take take me gold, take me treasures. And this is what we're going to touch on again in the Parsha, the, mm. the fact that, um, Everything that was contributed to the tabernacle 
God gave it to the people in the first place. Yeah. Because he put favour on the Egyptians in their sight. You yeah. Know? yeah. So wow. they, they willingly parted their goods mm. to the Israelites and said, you know, take this with you. Take yeah. with you. Wow. And they also would have had friends and relationships as well. A multitude came out with us. Mm. Yeah. But they said, take this with you, take this with you. So everything that was contributed to the tabernacle, yeah. God had provided it in the yeah. first yeah. place. Yeah. 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 Which makes you think, when he gives us gifts, we are supposed to Mm. Uh, used it for the kingdom. Used it for, for God's will for His yeah, kingdom. Yeah, yeah. You know, wow. it's the same wow. thing going on. It wasn't that Fifty million, just what people gave freely as well. Like there was no commandment. Yeah, there yeah. So, no so it says um, voluntarily. I, I, yeah, br- yeah, brilliant, Bex. That's, that's the next scripture I've got. It's Exodus chapter thirty-five, verse five, and it says, "Take from among you an offering to the Lord, whoever is of a willing heart, mm-hmm. um, let him bring as an offering to the Lord gold, silver, and bronze." So it just shows here that. Um, you, you know, it's all of a willing heart. It's almost a sense in a test, isn't it? Have all this gold. What are you going to do with it? You're millionaires. Mm. What are you going to do with that money? You know, we're millionaires. What are we going to do with our spiritual walk? You know, so it's interesting. And in a, in a, in a all of the literal sense, another way you could look at it is that God is still merciful within it. Because if Saviour was, wasn't that good and you, you know, you, a year or two later, I think it was two years, wasn't it, when he started setting up the tabernacle. If you've, if you've already blown all your, mil- your millions, what, what, what could you do? God still had a, a way where you could offer wool, you could still offer linen, you could still offer copper coins, and um, there were still other means. You didn't have to offer the gold, and it's not how much you offer; it's how much it's worth to you, isn't it? That that's that's what it is when it comes to offering to God, and we see that in in the in the gospel message, don't we? In the gospels, in Mark. Um, chapter 12 verse 41 we see the widow's offering don't we and I'm just going to read it now and it's I, I loved it, these couple of verses of scripture Joe covered it beautifully a couple of passages back um, but we're just going to read it again and it says as Yeshua was sitting opposite the treasury he watched the crowd putting money into it and many rich people put in large amounts then one poor widow came and put in two small copper coins mm-hmm. which amounted to a small fraction of, an, of a denarius mm-hmm. Yeshua called his disciples and said, Truly I tell you, the poor widow has put more than all the others into this treasury, for they all contributed out of their surplus, but she, out of her poverty, has put in all she had to live on. Wow, so it's just so powerful, isn't it? Even, you know, you could say, oh, well, 50 million, why does God need 50 million notes to test our hearts? And even then he makes a way because we can offer literally the two, two copper coins and God doesn't look at how much it is, it's how much it's worth to you. Yeah. And individually, we all must count the cost of our war. We, yeah. we truly do, you know, we have to count the cost yeah. of, 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 of what it is to, to, to call ourselves a disciple, to call ourselves a believer. It really is. And, and, and we're going to look at this a little bit more because in Luke chapter four, 14, verse 28, I'm going to read a couple of scriptures on, on what it is to count the cost because Yeshua brings this much better than, than I ever could. And he says, he says this, which of you wishing to build a tower does not first sit down and count the cost Mm -hmm. to see if he has the resources to complete it? (coughs) Otherwise, if he lays the foundation and is unable to finish the work, everyone who sees him will will ridicule him, saying this man could not finish what he started to build. Or what king on his way to war with another king will not first sit down and consider whether he can engage with 10,000 men with the one coming against them with 20,000. And if he is unable, he will send a delegation while the other king is still far off to ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any one of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Wow, it's so, so powerful scripture, isn't it? And, you know, everyone's on their individual personal walk and everyone um, has to count the cost, count the cost of this walk and... Just some questions to consider. You know, if we believe this walk is real, if we truly believe it's real, how much is the truth worth to me? How much is the truth worth to you? Seriously, do you treat yourself like you're a millionaire? Do you treat yourself like you've just escaped Egypt and you're rich? You know, am I willing to give up the chains that are holding me back? That's an that's a interesting question. A lot of people say, I want to be healed, but do you want to let go of the chains? Do I want to leave Egypt? Have I left Egypt, but Egypt hasn't left me? 
Do you want to become rich? Are you counting the cost? How do people perceive me on this walk? That's another big one. That was a big one for me, you know, when I was coming in this. How are people going to view me? How is my family going to view me? You know, how am I going to be perceived on this walk if I share the faith? Count the cost. That's us in our mind. We're counting the cost. What is it worth to us? How do I want to be perceived representing the Most High? Or more importantly, how does God want me to represent Him? And with that, we we're going to quickly move on now to chapter 39. Um, unless anything, anyone else has got anything to add? Anyone at all? Going once, going twice? No? Okay. Um, oh, actually, there was one other little interesting point that I wanted to mention, and it was, um, let me see, what verse is it? Just before we move on, just a little interesting note in verse 26, we actually see an age of accountability being brought up. It says, a becker for each man, that is a half a shekel, according to the shekel of the sanctuary, for everyone included in the numbering from 20 years old and above. And it goes on to say um, 20 years old and above, and it counts the number of men, men there. So just a side note, I guess, not to get too detoured on the matter, but it's interesting to see what the Bible sees as, as a man age 20 and above. You know, I, I think that's just quite fascinating because, you know, we've got in the UK, you can get married at 16, you can drink. Um, you know, at the age of, I think it's 18, isn't it? Uh, where, where in the States, um, it, it, it's, it's different, isn't it? You can't drink till the age of 21, but you can go to war at the age of 17, 18. So it's just interesting to see what, what, what the Bible sees as a man. And for me, I've always, um, that, that's always been a little bit of um, practical advice, you know, with families and stuff like that. It's, it's okay, look, you're a man now, it's age 20. There's a level of accountability there. And when you come 20 years of age, and that spoke to me at one time in my walk, I just thought to point that out, just a little side note um, for anyone who's listening. So um, with that, we'll, we'll just quickly move on to chapter 39 and um, get into it. So this is making the garments of the priesthood now. So we should be a little bit more familiar with these. And um, is it okay if you read this chapter, brother? No problem, of course. Yeah, I, I thought I was a man when I was 20, but <laughs> <laughs> I was still playing hide and seek, climbing trees. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. But, no, I'm a man, I'm a man. I shave, don't you know? <laughs> it's funny, I think yeah. it might be different in different cultures. And yeah, diff yeah, different yeah, yeah. eras throughout history, you know? Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. Because they lived longer then as well, so you know, things yeah, that's, are a, that's a fair comment, yeah, yeah, really fair comment. I definitely didn't feel like I was a man at uh, yeah. 20 years old. Yeah. I still felt I was a, I was a boy, really. Yeah. Um, so chapter 39, we, we'll, we'll just go, actually, we'll just go to um, verse 31. Yep. That's good, brother. All the way to 31 from yeah. the top. Okay, bro. Thank you very much. Of the blue, purple and scarlet thread, they made garments of ministry for ministering in the holy place and made the holy garments for Aaron, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the ephod of gold, blue, purple and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen. And they beat the gold into thin sheets and cut it into threads to work it in with the blue, purple and scarlet thread and the fine linen into artistic designs. They made shoulder straps for it to couple it together. It was coupled together at its two edges, and the intricately woven band of his ephod that was on it was of the same workmanship, woven of gold, blue, purple and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And they set onyx stones enclosed in settings of gold. They were engraved, as signets are engraved, with the names of the sons of Israel. He put them on the shoulders of the ephod as memorial stones for the sons of Israel, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he made the breastplate artistically woven like the workmanship of the ephod, of gold, blue, purple and scarlet thread, and of fine woven linen. They made the breastplate square by doubling it. A span was its length and a span its width when doubled. And they set it in four rows of stones. A row with a sardius, a topaz and an emerald was the first row. The second row, a turquoise, a sapphire and a diamond. The third row, a jacinth, an agate and an amethyst. The fourth row, a beryl, an onyx and a jasper. They were enclosed in settings of gold in their mountings. There were twelve stones according to the names of the sons of Israel. According to their names, engraved like a signet, each one with its own name according to the twelve tribes. And they made chains for the breastplate at the ends, like braided cords of pure gold. 
They also made two settings of gold and two gold rings and put the two rings on the two ends of the breastplate. And they put the two braided chains of gold in the two rings on the ends of the breastplate. The two ends of the two braided chains they fastened in the two settings and put them on the shoulder straps of the ephod in the front. And they made the two rings of gold and put them on the two ends of the breastplate on the edge of it, which was on the inward side of the ephod. They made two other gold rings and put them on the two shoulder straps underneath the ephod towards its front, right at the seam above the intricately woven band of the ephod. And they bound the breastplate by means of its rings to the rings of the ephod with a blue cord, so that it would be above the intricately woven band of the ephod, and that the breastplate would not come loose from the ephod, as the Lord had commanded Moses. He made the robe of the ephod of woven work, all of blue, and there was an opening in the middle of the robe, like the opening in a coat of mail, with a woven binding all around the opening so that it would not tear. They made on the hem of the robe pomegranates of blue, purple and scarlet, and of fine woven linen. And they made bells of pure gold, and put the bells between the pomegranates, on the hem of the robe all around between the pomegranates. A bell and a pomegranate, a bell and a pomegranate, all around the hem of the robe, to minister in, as the Lord had commanded Moses. They made tunics, artistically woven, of fine linen, for Adam and his sons, a turban of fine linen, exquisite hats of fine linen, short trousers of fine woven linen, and a sash of fine woven linen with blue, purple and scarlet thread, made by a weaver, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Then they made the plate of the holy crown of pure gold, and wrote on it an inscription, like the engraving on the signet, Holiness to the Lord. And they tied it to a blue cord, to fasten it above on the table, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Hallelujah. Amen. Wow. So another intricate, detailed account of the priestly garments. Um, yeah, it just goes to show the importance of, of, of what God's trying to show us here in Scripture. Sometimes we like the narrative. We like to hear the Israelites leaving Egypt or King David and Goliath. But, you know, Yah here is, is saying, no, look, pay attention. Pay attention to these priestly robes. There's something really significant in them. And we've looked at them in the past on how um, in Ephesians 6 with the spiritual armour, how they relate to, to, the, to the priestly armour of, of, of that time. But today we're going to have a little look at um, something a little bit different. We're going to look at the colours um, within, the, within the priestly garment. And this here, this was the, um, this was the coronation, wasn't it? Um, or, or, or sorry, this was the, this was the robes um, for, for Aaron to be coronated into the position and for the priests. So what we're going to do is we're going to pay a little bit of attention on the colours, really. Um, because curiously enough, um, the blue... That was that was in the in the garments. Um, pe people didn't know what this was for thousands of years. It, it was actually just a recent discovery that they found um, uh, how they actually made made this blue colour. And apparently, what it was, it was um, blue sea snails. And and they, what it is, they make a um, they make, what is it? I think it's like an um, um, secretes like a yellow fluid. And then in the sunlight, I've got it here. Um, and when it's exposed to sunlight, it actually turns blue and it creates like a dye. And then that's made for like the seats and um, the, the, the garments. Mm -hmm. And and this this was said to have been lost for like 1,300 years. And um, what, what what some scholars believe is, is that these blue snails was over harvested. And then and then there just wasn't any of the land, but they've started to come back and they've started to find them now mm -hmm. um, across Israel, which is quite fascinating. Um, so I just thought to, to bring that because it's 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 really interesting how Yah uses unclean animals for for um you know righteous and 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 and, and holy holy set up, set apart uh, tunic and we're going to see this as well because the red was actually made by um something called the crimson worm the crimson worm we're going to be having a look at this because for the for those who haven't heard it this is absolutely incredible the crimson worm and i've just got this little statement here in biblical times, the red dye excreted from the crimson worm was used in the high priest's robe and probably for the red dye used on the ram skins to create the covering of the tabernacle in the wilderness. Uses of this red dye continue today. The worm's body and shell, while still red, are attached to the tree and scraped off and used to make what is called royal red dye so you can you can people actually like have farms of this and you'll put them on the trees and then you'll go around and you'll they'll, they'll create this red dye and and um it's this royal red dye and saudi used to dye the um all the different robes and within this there's this there's, there's a beautiful picture because 
Um, we're going to look at the life the life cycle of this crimson worm. And if anyone's seen any pictures online, it's, it doesn't really look like a worm. It looks more like a beetle or a grub. It looks it, and it attaches itself to the tree. And this is the life cycle. Um, and it all points to Yeshua on the cross. And this is this is the life cycle of the crimson worm. When the female crimson worm is ready to lay her eggs, which happens only once in her life, she climbs up a tree or a fence and attaches herself to it. With her body attached to the wood, a hard crimson shell forms. It is a shell so hard and so secure to the wood that it can only be removed by tearing apart the body, which will kill the worm. The female worms would lay eggs under her body, under the protective shell, and when the larvae, larvae hatch, they remain under the mother's protective shell so that the baby worms can feed on the living body of the mother's worms for three days. After three days, the mother worm dies and her body excretes a crimson or scarlet dye that stains the wood of which she is attached and also her baby worms. The baby worms remain crimson colored for their entire lives. Thereby, they are identified as crimson worms. And even more interestingly, on day four, the tail of the mother's worm pulls up into her head, forming a heart-shaped body that is no longer crimson, but has turned into a snow-white wax that looks like a patch of wool on, a, on the tree or on the fence. It then begins to flake off and drop to the ground, looking like snow. So we're going to try and break this down. Some of you may be thinking already, some of your Yeshua alarms might be going off. Some of the Jesus alarms. We like to find Yeshua on every page in, in, in this group, don't we? we? We believe he is the, the, the word, the word that, is, that made flesh. That's what it's written in the Bible. So he has to be here. You know, we get all magnifying glasses out. Where is he on the page? So we see the priestly garments and the dyed, the dyed red aren't he, with this crimson worm. The very dye of the robes, what the priests are wearing have the crucifixion story within them. Let's have a look at some parallels, okay, with this crimson worm and Yeshua, Jesus Christ, on the cross. The crimson worm attaches herself to a tree for the love of her children, okay? That's parallel number one. Yeshua willingly allowed himself to be attached to a tree for the love of his children. How do we know that he willingly attached himself? 1 John 3, 16. And um, by this, we know what is love. Yeshua laid down his life for us and, and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. You see, it wasn't nails that was holding Yeshua on the cross. It was love. You know, Yeshua could have called down 12 legion of angels at any time and just got off the cross, but he didn't, did he? He laid his life down. He had a willing heart as we was looking at earlier. And in Galatians chapter one, verse four, it says, who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our Father. Okay, so it was it, it was the will. The will was always there to do it. And there's another parale parallel. Just as the mother worm attaching herself to a tree is part of God's design for the worm's life cycle, it was a part of God's plan to send the son to be attached to a tree, a wooden cross to die for us. So this, this worm was always designed to be attached to this tree. And if it would have been pulled off, it would have died. And it's the exact same way with Yeshua. In 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9, it says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life, a set-apart life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because it was his plan from before the beginning of time to show his grace through Christ Jesus. So the purpose of this worm, it's almost the same as Yeshua. It was his purpose all along. The mother, the mother worm, when crushed, excretes a crimson scarlet dye that both covers the baby worms and stains or marks them. Wow. What do we see? We see Jesus in the scripture. He was bruised, he was crushed for our iniquities. We know the scripture, it's Isaiah chapter 53, a prophecy, verse five, it says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us a peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. What did the larvae do? They fed off the mother, didn't they? And they was made, they was brought to life by the sacrifice of their mother. His scourgings and the nails that were driven into his hands and feet brought forth crimson, scarlet blood that washes away our sins and marks us as his own, just like the larvae. Revelation chapter one, verse five. 
and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over all the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and what? And washed us from our sins with his own blood. Here's another one, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you were once far off, having been brought near by the blood of Christ. Wow, it's the crimson worm. He's marked us as our own. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Let's go have a look at a few more parallels. Just as the baby worm is dependent on her mother to shield and to mark it with crimson when the baby worm is to come to life, a repentant sinner must depend on the blood of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins to receive new life and to be marked as his home. Acts chapter 4 verse 12. Salvation exists in no one else for there is no other name under the heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Hallelujah. First Peter chapter 1 verse 18. For you know that it was not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life you inherited from your forefathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without spot or blemish. It's all there, isn't it? It's there in the crimson worm. We're going to keep going a little bit now. After the mother has sacrificed herself, she turns into a white wax colour that looks like wool on the tree and then begins to flake off and fall to the ground looking like snow. Okay, what's the parallel? The manna. Yeah, yeah, yeah that, that's a brilliant one. I didn't think of that. That's good. Yeah, come, the, the manna from the heaven I've got here. The worm turns white like the white linen garments of the priest, as we've just read. We just read that the white linen garments was designed for the priests. The worms, what happens to the worms then? Well, the worm, the worm children, the larvae, they grow up to be adult worms. And they repeat the same process, the same life cycle, don't they? They attach themselves to a tree, the sacrifice for the children, and then they're made white, like the linen garments of the priests. And that's how we are to take up our own cross, like Yeshua. And what are we re rewarded with at the end? What do we see in Revelation? What are we rewarded with once we lay our life down daily, taking up the cross daily? In Revelation chapter 19, verse 8, it says, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory. Give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. She was given clothing of fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen she wears is the righteous acts of the saints. So just as we must be a daily sacrifice and like the worm sacrificed and turned white, what's our reward? It's the white linen the white linen robes, isn't it? Resurrection. On the you resurrection. Yeshua, he's in white. You know, he's, he's in white. He's shining like white. Also, the man that says the commands to be added in heaven, he yeah, gave us from the manna. Hallelujah, yeah. Yeah, from the, yeah, the, the bread of heaven. Hallelujah. will be washed whiter than stars. Yeah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, yeah, definitely. Um, that's the, that's my next one, sister. You're on fire today <laughs> with the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18. So we, can we see if we can do a bingo? <laughs> Um, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. It's all about becoming a set-apart bride. This is what it's all about, a priest for God. Let's go back to Revelation again. Where we're up to in the book now, chaos is about to ensue. What do we see in Revelation? The angels saying, "Do not harm the earth, nor the sea, nor the trees, until we have, until we shall have sealed the servants of God on uh, on their foreheads." So before any destruction can take place, a seal must take place on their foreheads. What have we just read? What have we just read to do with the priests? Yeah. Holiness, on Holiness on the Lord on the turban. In the white garments, the worm is not only a picture of our Messiah, but a picture of our walk of picking up the cross daily, being like Christ. Philippians chapter 2 verse 5, each of you should not only look to your own interests, but also to each other's interests. Let this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Then Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 16 verse 24, if anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. The sacrifice, that's what, that's what it takes. That's what it takes. 
And to sum it all up now, before we come to an end for a break, what do we get in Matthew chapter 27, verse 46? If you're still not sold on the crimson worm, what do we see in scripture? We get this powerful scripture. I remember first hearing this on the Passion of Christ. I, I don't even think I've read my Bible at this point. And the scripture goes like this. It's Yeshua on the cross and it says, And about the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, Lama, Sabbath, Sabatachanini. How'd you pronounce that one, brother? Yeah, you know, you're close enough. Eli, Eli. It's Eli. Eli, Eli. Lama Sabatachanini. That is, we've got it in English for those who can't um, speak Hebrew. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me on the cross? Wow. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I remember the first time hearing that. I was like, wow. You know, this is real. Is, is, is Yeshua, is Jesus giving up on the cross here? He's saying, God, why are you forsaking me? You know, it, it, what, it, this is what he's saying on the cross. I remember feeling so heavy when I read this. And people was mocking him at the time, saying he's trying to call upon Elijah. You know, he was mocking him. But when you start to understand the scriptures, when you start interpreting the scriptures, we actually see even on the cross he was being a rabbi. Even on the cross he was being a teacher because he was trying to drop a hint to everyone listening. Why? Because he's actually quoting the beginning of Psalm 22. And this was opened up. This, this Psalm 22 was written a thousand years before. A thousand years before is, is, is crucifixion. And we're going to read it now. We're going to read a section of it. Okay, so let's go to Psalm 22, everyone. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? People was mocking him on the cross. Ah, look at him. He, he said he could raise the dead, but he can't even raise himself. But what was he doing? He was pointing them all to a scripture, wasn't he? He was saying, I'm the rabbi until death. I'm going to teach you now the greatest lesson. And it's in Psalm 22, okay? It goes like this. It says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a Psalm of David. Holy. Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my words of groaning? I cry out by day, oh my God, but you do not answer. And by night, but I, do, I have no rest. Okay, is it all, it's all in despair? Are we giving up? No, we're not, because what does it say? It says, yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. You, our fathers, trusted. They trusted and you delivered them. They cried out to you and we're set free. They trusted in you and we're not disappointed. But I am a worm and not a man. Scorned by men and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They sneer and shake their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let the Lord deliver him. Let the Lord rescue him since he delights in him. Hallelujah. I'd love to read on, but we're short on time. So read that one in your, in your private time. But as you can probably figure by now, he says, I am a worm and not a man. I am the crimson worm. The, the common Hebrew word for worm is rimmer. And it's defined in, in scripture as maggot or a worm. And it's used in the book of Job. It's the Strong's H7415. So we get this word for maggot and worm. However, in Psalm 22, verse 6, the word for worm is tola, tola, tola. And it's Strong's Dictionary, H8438. And what's fascinating about this word, it's the word that comes up in this Torah portion this week. It's the word we get when we're seeing the, 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 the order to put together the priestly garments. It's the word we get in Hebrew where it says about the blue, the purple and the scarlet robes. And it's that same word. This word, tola. Defines the word, it, it defines the word as the crimson worm. In the Blue Letter Bible, its definition can mean scarlet or worm. The same Hebrew word tola comes up in our Parsha. And it's just, it's just incredible. He was the crimson worm. He was the sacrifice on the cross. And he was trying to say to them, only if you knew, if only you had ears to hear and eyes to see. Forgive them, Father. For they don't know what they've done. And Exodus 38, verse 23, this is where we see it. And with him was Aholiab, the son of Ashiamach of the tribe of Dan, an engraver and designer, a weaver of blue, purple, and scarlet thread. 
and of violence, the same word that we just see in Psalm 22. Even down to the dye of the priests, their, their garments had symbolism, symbolism and typology of Yeshua. Every single detail matters. In this crimson worm, we find a hidden meaning of biblical significance of the priestly robes, all pointing to the death, burial and resurrection of Yeshua. These priests was just the shadow of the greater priest to come. God is in creation. The worm has been designed to represent crucifixion, a hat tip from the creator. The psalm was written and prophesied a thousand years before Yeshua was on the cross. And as it is written, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. So in Psalm 19, 1, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows his handiwork. You can't deny God in creation. And with that, we'll just take a break. Of our Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay, right, right, so let's get into it. So we actually, we stopped at the end of chapter 39. Um, so we've still got from verse 32 all the way to the end. Um, so we're just gonna, we're gonna start there. So welcome back everyone online. Welcome back to Zoom. Let's get into the word. We only spend an hour and a half here every week. So let's really try and be attentive now to the word. Let's try and take it in and, and, and be able to project it for the rest of our week to those who we meet. Let's fill our oil. Um, so let, let's um, go from verse 32, and um, if you could be kind enough to read, Tommy, when you're ready. Yes, yeah, certainly. It's titled in New King James, The Work Completed. Thus all the work of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting was finished, and the children of Israel did according to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so they did. And they brought the tabernacle to Moses, the tent and all its furnishings, its clasps, its boards, its bars, its pillars and its sockets, the covering of the ramskins, excuse me, the covering of ramskins dyed red, the covering of badger skins and the veil of the covering, the ark of the testimony with its poles and the mercy seat, the table, all its utensils and the showbread, the pure gold lampstand with its lamps, the lamps set in order, all its utensils and the oil for the light, the gold altar, the anointing oil and the sweet incense, the screen for the tabernacle door, the bronze altar, its grate of bronze, its poles and all its utensils, the laver with its base, the hangings of the court, its pillars and its sockets, the screen for the court gate, its cords and its pegs, all the utensils for the service of the tabernacle for the tent of meeting, and the garments of ministry to minister in the holy place, the holy garments for Aaron the priest and his son's garments to minister as priests. According to all that the Lord had commanded Moses, so the children of Israel did all the work. Then Moses looked over all the work, and indeed they had done it. As the Lord had commanded, just so they had done it, and Moses blessed them. Hallelujah. Wow, so we finally see all the items come together. The past few weeks we've had images on the screen, we've been looking at into all the little details, spiritually and physically, of what they represented. And it's just, isn't it just great just to see it all come together now? You know, when you never finish like a complete work, you feel like Moses, don't you? He says, then Moses looked over all the work, and indeed they had done it as the Lord had commanded. You know, what an achievement this was. They went from slavery and he was redeemed. And now they've just, they've just completed the, the, the ark, the, the, the dwelling place for God to come and dwell on earth. And it just reminds me of um, in the garden or at the in, in chapters, uh, Genesis uh, number one and it's verse 31. Um, There's a similar sort of phrasing that, that, that come to mind when I was reading it. And it says, then God looked over all he had made and he saw that it was very good. It just reminds me there Then Moses looked over all the work and indeed they had done it as the Lord had commanded, hallelujah. You know, what What, what an achievement. Um, so we're gonna keep reading now. This is the final chapter in Exodus. <laughs> it's come a long way from, from the slavery in Egypt. So let's soak it in um, for, for this year now. And it's the tabernacle 
erected and arranged. And I'm going to read this chapter. And as we're reading through this one, if we can all follow along, and I just want to see if we can get the room going a little bit. So when we come up to, as the Lord had commanded Moses, if we could all try and say it at the same time. I'll try the other cue. We've never done this before. <laughs> <laughs> so let's, let's, ensemble, bit, yeah. yeah, so let's see if we can do it. Let's, let's get some in, in, interaction going. So the tabernacle erected and arranged. So chapter 40, Something Exodus. Exodus. So, so, <laughs> okay, okay, I'll, 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 I'll speak up on the part Typical on the part theater. of it what we need to repeat. So it's so when it says in the scripture, as the Lord had commanded Moses, we all go together. Yeah. As, as the Lord, Lord commanded, commanded Moses. Moses. Hallelujah. One more time. As, as the, the Lord, Lord had commanded, commanded Moses. Moses. Okay. There we go. That's enough practice for you there, Andy. <laughs> um so th so let's go. Chapters 40. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On the first day of the month. You shall set up the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. You shall put in it the ark of the testimony and the partition of the ark with the veil. You shall bring in the table and the arrange the things uh, that, that are to be set in order on it. And you shall bring in the lampstand and light its lamps. You shall also set the altar of gold for the incense before the ark of the testimony and put up the screen for the door of the tabernacle. Then you shall set the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting. And you shall set um, the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water in it. You shall set up the court all around and hang up the screen on the court gate. And you shall take an anointing oil and the tabernacle, all that is in it, and you shall hallow it and all its utensils and, and it shall be holy. You shall anoint the altar of burnt offering and all utensils and consecrate the altar. The altar shall be most holy and you shall anoint the laver and its base and consecrate it. Then you shall bring Aaron, his sons, to the door of the tabernacle of meeting and wash them, um, and wash them with water. You shall put the holy garments on Aaron and anoint him and consecrate him that he may minister to me as a priest. And you shall bring his sons and clothes, uh, clothe them with tunics you shall anoint them as you anointed their father, that they minister to me as priests, for their anointing shall surely be an everlasting priesthood throughout their generations. Thus Moses did, according to all that Lord had commanded him, so he did. Okay, we're going to keep going. And it, and it came to pass in the first month of the second year, on the first day of the month, that the tabernacle was raised up. So Moses raised up the tabernacle, fastened its sockets, set up its boards, put in the bars and raised up its pillars. And he spread out the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering of the tent on top of it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He took the testimony and put it into the ark, inserted the poles through the rings of the ark and put the mercy seat on top of the ark. And he brought the ark into the tabernacle, hung up the veil of covering and put and partition, uh, partitioned off the, off the testimony as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the table in the tabernacle of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the veil and he set the bread in order upon it before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the lampstand in the tabernacle of meeting across from the table on the south side of the tabernacle and he lit the lamps before the Lord as the Lord had commanded Moses. He put the altar in the tabernacle of meeting in front of the veil and he burned sweet incense on it as the Lord had commanded Moses. He hung, up, he hung up the screen at the door of the tabernacle and he put the altar of the burnt offering before the door of the tabernacle of the tent of meeting and offered up on it the burnt offering and the grain offering as the Lord had commanded Moses. He set the laver between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar and put water there for washing and Moses, Aaron, and his sons would wash their hands and their feet with water from it. Whenever they were, went into the tabernacle of meeting, and when they came near the altar, they washed, as the Lord had commanded Moses. And he raised up the court all around the tabernacle and the altar, and hung up the screen of the court, so Moses finished the work. Hallelujah. We'll just take a little pause there. And um, thanks for bearing me with me on that one. It's a bit longer than what I thought. But as you can see here, we want to do as the Lord commands. And, and, and as the Lord had commanded Moses, so he did. And I've got a little testimony to share this week um, about trying to listen to the voice of Yah. 
and trying to listen to what God has commanded. And I was reading this this Parsha and that's all I could feel echoing through my mind <laughs> was as the Lord commanded Moses, come on now, Jack, you know, and um, pick it up. So the testimony um, I'm, I'm about to share is that it. Bless you. Are you okay there? <laughs> is, it, is she okay? Oh, here we go. Um, I'll have a drink as well before I join you. <laughs> um, so just a little testimony um, this week. I've been praying about work-life balance. And I've been, uh, some of you may know, I work for a mobile um, network. And, I, I, you know, it's been a few miles away from mine, about 50 miles away. So I do a lot of driving every day, working there full time. And I've been, in all honesty, I have been really struggling with ministry and full time. It's just been so, so difficult. <laughs> Um, the job has its, you know, it does have, have its perks. You know, praise be to Yah, I get the Sabbath off, I've negotiated it off, the Fridays off, I managed to get the feast off. It, it's been such a blessing um, in, in my life. And, and, and it's, it's, it's just been a, it's, it, yeah, it's, that's the only way I can describe it. It's been a blessing. Um, but lately I've been, you know, really burnt out with it. I've been trying to do the Torah portion. I've been trying to do bits in the week and I've been praying. I've been like, Father, what do you want me to do? I'm, I'm speaking to brethren. I'm like, look, I'm, I'm feeling, I'm burning the candle at both ends here. And, um, you know, I was like, Father, please, I'm just, you know, just please speak to me. So I'm looking in the Bible and I didn't hear his voice. And then one day I walked into work and, um, and, he, and he said to me, I've been praying the night before. And I was at the Shabbat meeting and I, and I was listening to the, to the Torah and the word, words being said. And I was just in two minds. What do I do? Do I leave? Do I stay? And I went into work and he said to me, OK, Jackie, um, we're closing down some of our stores. So we're actually going to have to demote you um, from the permission uh, position you're in. Um, just because you're in a, in a temporary position and, um, and, and we've got an influx of staff coming in who, who are in that permanent position. So they have to take your role. And I was like, oh, Father, is this it? Is this, is this you trying to say, look, coming to the end of it? So I was praying about it a bit further. And, and I, just, I, just, I just wasn't at peace with, with, with being there for whatever reason. And then one Shabbat, um, I, was, I, I um, went to bed Friday evening. I was in the Word. And I, in the morning, this has only ever happened to me about three or four times. I, I, was, I was woken up by a loud shout and it was leave <laughs> and it was like i, I went I, sh I, sh I shook and woke up and i was like oh okay okay god i see where you're taking me with this but then as the day progresses as i put my shoes on as i'd have my breakfast yeah. as i come to the shabbat and that i'm starting mm -hmm. thinking was that just the end of a dream <laughs> well you know it, it's daylight outside now you're not quite as scary um, you know it goes on and I was like, okay, you know what? I'm not going to be too hasty into this anyway. It's a big decision. You know, Yah says six days you will labor and one day you will rest. You know, so I didn't want to just drop my job, especially with all the blessings it, 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 it's gave me. So anyway, I come to the Torah portion. And I think it was Tommy that was doing it. And he was speaking and it was all about your heart. And if your heart's not in it, don't do it. And, um, and I was just like, oh, wow, okay. Yeah, yeah, you, you're speaking to me. Not only, you know, you woke me up, but you're speaking to me through the word now. And just different people who I was speaking to, I just felt like I had confirmation. And I was like, I don't really want to quit, though, because when I actually went through it in my mind, I was like, okay, financially, you know, is this sensible? Is this wise? This doesn't make sense. This, this, this isn't really practical. And anyway... Um, I'm in work on the Sunday. It's after the Sabbath and I'm serving this girl. I've served customers all day at work in retail. And uh, she's an American girl. She comes in and she's like, I need a SIM card or something. So I say, yeah, take a seat. And we're just chatting and talking. And, and she's like, do you like your job? And I'm like, well, depends what day you ask me on, really. <laughs> and she's just like, she's just like, you should quit. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm praying the night before. I'm like, oh, yeah. <laughs> why <laughs> she just, and I, like it was almost like she didn't know why she said it i tried to ask her she was just like oh you know um i just and got the sim card and sort of went out and i was like wow okay you're trying to talk to me or something here it was almost like she didn't know she said it and anyway um a week goes by and um i come to the torah portion again so i got them back to front it was joe's first and then i went to tommy's torah portion and, and it was all about your heart not being in it and anyway so i thought you know what i'm gonna hand him me notice i said 
it's right. You know, God says you, if your heart isn't in it, um, you, you know, if you're lacking faith in something and doing it, you know, it can almost be classed as sin in, in, in a way. So I was like, right, I'm, you know, I've, I've had me signs. I've, I've had confirmation through multiple people. I could be here all day if, if I was to go into it. Um, but I thought, right, I'm going to hand me notice in. So I handed me notice in and I was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm handing me notice for work. You know, I'd like to leave at the end of the month, please. And the manager was like, yeah, no problem. Anyway, two days go by. He rings me. He goes, I know you was getting demoted, Jack, but um, and I know you're dri driving like an hour to work and back a day, but um, how does the manager's position sound like in St. Helens? It's on your doorstep. <laughs> um, it's great hours. Um, and I'm thinking, wow, Babylon's mad. Like, they was going to demote me and now they're pumping me up two <laughs> yeah. spots. Like, but it sounds good, though. Hang on. Maybe you uh, asked me to leave so it would prompt him so I could get the job. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and then and then and then and then people are telling me like, yeah, that's great. That's such a good idea. You know, you can be them. I don't have to. You know, I work in sales. You don't have to sell anymore. You can just coach people. You know, I'm not, I feel like I can naturally coach anyway. I'm like, yeah, that that sounds amazing. Nine till half five. It's twenty minute walk down the road. Five minute drive. I'll be home. I'll be home for tea and and, and biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> so so yeah, I was like, right, okay. So I was thinking, yeah. I'll, I'll I'm thinking this does sound good this maybe this is meant to be and then every time i was going for it i just didn't have a piece there was a war inside there was a war inside me and i was like okay I, i've got till monday to decide so I, I had a couple of days um to decide and the area manager was going to ring me it was all sort of a covert move what was going on he was the one that moved out to that store and um and and, and anyway it was me sliding in last minute and I was just like, okay, so I've got a bit of time to think about this. And anyway, um, I was just, I, was, I, just couldn't, I just couldn't have any peace in the scenario at all. But I was offered something, a, a deal I couldn't refuse really. It was on my doorstep, better pay. And I said to him, well, what about the Sabbath? I'm a manager, surely, you know, what will the obligations be? And he was like, no, you can have the Sabbath off. We've known you for years now. You've always had the Sabbath. Okay, great. What about the five weeks in summer where I want to go to America and you can only have two weeks off on company time? Five weeks, no problem. You can have that in America. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this is winning. I'm like, okay, um, you know, Sukkot, the festivals, I can still, still take that off as voluntary time. They're like, yeah, still take that off as voluntary time. You can do the rotors. You're the manager now. I'm like, wow, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking, yeah, you know, laughing. So anyway, um, and, and then not only that, um, some of you may know, I'm calling a, a lady in America, and for her um, to potentially move over here, you need to earn over £19,000 salary a year. So I'm thinking, okay, future, um, finance, moving up, moving out, saving up, got all these things. But anyway, God just wasn't letting me go with it. It was like it, it, it was like a dog with a bone. I just, I, I was just in turmoil over it. One day I was saying, yeah, I'm staying. It's a blessing from God. I'm a Joseph in Egypt from waking up, up to the top. Another, another day I'm saying, no, but God tells me leave. And God hates double minus. You read yeah, this all yeah. through the word. He despises it. So I'm like, okay, God, I don't want to be in this way. And, and he's like, son, you, I've, I've told you already what to do. That's what, that's the internal yeah. struggle that I feel and anyway so I was reading this Torah portion and I was going through it and what did I read do as the Lord has commanded yeah. or Mo and Moses done what the Lord commanded and I seen it time and time again and I was like you've said your word father and I've got to follow through with it I've had confirmations through other people Joe rang me when 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 it all happened about me leaving and he was like he was like yeah that's your sign and I can't kind, of, kind of not dismissed it, but I, I put it on the back burner and I was like, I don't know, is it though? <laughs> is it? <laughs> and and ultimately, you know, um, we, we have got to do what the what, what our father says. And and sometimes the sacrifice can can be great. And, and I said to my boss in the end, I said, look, I can't go into somewhere if my heart isn't in it. I've got to be sold out. I've got to be all in. I can't go and pretend to try and coach people when my heart isn't in this job. And um, I decided to make, um, to, to, leave, to quit the job um, it was a blessing. He was saying, okay, you've got two weeks to the end of the month, but um, but I'm going to pay you for an extra extra two weeks on top of that. So it turned out a blessing and I decided to step out in faith. And I haven't seen the fruit of it yet, in all honesty, because it, I've, I've still got two days to work before my notice ends. But what I'm trying to say is, is that sometimes it takes a leap of faith um, um, with these things. And I really felt that Yah was, was, was speaking to me regarding this situation. And ultimately, you know, Yah can bless you either way. You know, he is a merciful God. 
what I do believe we've got to do and um, what, 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 what our father is, um, is commanding us to do. So that opens the question, you know, how do we get confirmation on God's voice? Because for me, that's, that, that is, that's a life changing crossroad there. You know, I could potentially stunt my future relationships, you know, uh, you know, finances at home, it says you're commanded to work, you know, so, but, but in this situation, I, it was so pressed upon me that I had to hand in my notice. So, so that does open the question, you know, I, I'd like to open up to the room, you know, in, in terms of confirmation, when, 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 ha, how would you say, and how would you confirm when Yara is speaking to you? What would you say, brother? Um, we consult his living word. Yeah. It ties in with his living word. Mm. <clears throat> Is his voice as, yeah. you, as you brought in the podcast mm -hmm. the other week, Tom? Um, a lot of people say they hear the audible voice, but we can actually hear the audible voice by reading mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. So we get confirmation in his word. Yeah, his law says on the account of two or three witnesses is a matter established. Mm -hmm. So we wait for that two or three in the confirmation. Um, the Lord can speak through his, his, his sent ones, his epistles, his, his apostles, his prophets. Um, so we, we wait for that confirmation on two or three witnesses. Oh, man. Um, and does the situation tally up with his attributes? Mm. So when we know him and know his character, does it tally up with his attributes? Is it his will? Yeah. Ultimately. Powerful. Um, I know that we... Yeah, we've, we, we, we talked about this, I think, yesterday, Becca and I as well. And, you know, confirmation of things, that's, that's always something that, that is very important because mm. people... You know, over the years, I'll go, oh, I've prayed about this, it's what God wants. And yeah. it's like, hang on, you know, you've prayed about it, it's what God mm -hmm. wants. Yeah, but God, uh, God's spoken to me, but where's your confirmation? Because yeah. it will confirm mm -hmm. it. And we've, there's been so many things through our mm -hmm. walk, um, you know, and ultimately, if you keep pushing and pushing, <coughs> God will just stop you. Yeah. He'll just stop it. He will. If it's not his will, mm -hmm. he will not let you do it. Amen. And wouldn't the Lord provide first something else you have responsibilities like car payment whatever Same, payment yeah. like yeah like wouldn't the lord give you something first before he moves you into the law right where you have no nothing yeah it's a great it's, it's a massive question it is a really massive question and that, that that's what i've been praying about for the past three weeks and for, and for me if the lord tells me to do something you know abraham got called out into the wilderness mm -hmm. he was a wealthy man he wasn't he wasn't a job set up in the wilderness for him same with and, the Israelites. Uh, same, the same, the same desert. with the Israelites. And, and, and yeah, sorry, go on for that. He becomes our provision. I think yeah. there we have to take that step of faith if we know it is worse yes. and then see the miraculous take place. Yeah. You know? And it is scary, you know, it does say in the word of God, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added onto you. And I felt like my work was becoming an idol and becoming a thorn in my side. I was speaking to Joe all the, side, all the time and he was saying, Jack, you're always tired, you know, you know. And, and, and when it becomes when it starts taking away from ministry work, you've really got to consider. And I, I just, just, just to say what Joe was saying as well, they're the two points I've got written down here. I would say the question was, how do we get confirmation that it's God's voice? Um, it's, it, you know, it's, and it's not, you know, an, another, another voice going on. Um, first and foremost, it's the word, Yeshua. It's the word made flesh and Yeshua is God. God's voice is the word. He would never tell you to do something that was sin or he would never tell you to do something uh, contrary to, to his attributes. And then the second thing is God speaking through other people. We do have a body mm -hmm. um, establishing it as a witness by two or more. But this, this is a big thing, brothers and sisters, it really is. And, and, and I believe it, it, it's been designed this way. So it is a relationship with the Spirit. Um, one of the gifts of the Spirit is the Spirit of discernment, to be able to discern these matters. You know, and this is why it requires a body to bounce ideas off each other. Because if I was just to keep this to myself and just do it before consulting people in the body, they they may advise or have the spirit of wisdom and and the same to to, to direct me otherwise. And um, so I, I don't think it's one size suits all. I don't think to answer your question, um, um, a, a job always has to come along. You know, sometimes you might have to, I might have to quit. I might have to be unemployed and walking down the street. And then I bump into a guy who offers me a job wherever I was still working, waiting for a job that wouldn't have happened. It's, it's, also, it's, it's making your family in burden if you have nothing and it puts them into a situation where they have to provide for you. And yeah. Suddenly that's big pressure on them. Definitely, too. definitely. You've got to be able to be in a position to be able to do this. It's quite strange you bring this subject mm. up. Because I've had a part-time job which has helped me. Yeah. Whatever, the car, the lot. Mm. 
and it's come to an end. And I laid flat before God last year, talking about it, you know. Mm. And all I got within me is I have set you free. Yeah. I didn't quite understand that, and I still don't understand right this minute. I don't know. But what's yeah. been coming to my thoughts is, I listened to what Yeshua did. He, he sent his, these men out, didn't he? To, he said, take, take, mm. he's telling them, don't take provision, don't yeah. take provision. Mm. Then you go back into Matthew, and he says, the Father knows the things mm. you have need of, you know what I mean? Yeah. The birds of the air, they neither sow nor reap, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Yeah. They don't gather into barns. So when you get a word so strong, and the only time I've ever had that, not in the work situation, that it was going into a, a Sunday organised building. Yeah. And God told me so clearly, didn't use the word to leave, because mm. I'd after many years agreed to become a member of that church, yeah, though I'd yeah. fought it for years. Mm -hmm. And he said, resign your membership. Mm. So I just assumed it was that building. I wasn't sure what to do. Mm. I kept going. Yeah. Then I realised I couldn't keep going. And then I'm going to another. And I'm trying to find... So you may be looking at the job. So I'm trying to find maybe a Sunday place that I should go to. Mm -hmm. And I was going to one. And all of a sudden, I realised the paganism that was in it. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? That God had already taken me out of Christmas. <clears throat> that paganism had taken me mm -hmm. out of that. And I thought... God told you to resign your membership. This is me to me. Yeah. But he didn't say, go to another Sunday building. Mm. And a faith walk is the hardest walk to yeah. walk for each and every one of us, especially when you think, well, I've got this responsibility. I've got. He knows the things yeah. you've got need of. He yeah. knows these things, you know what I mean? Yeah. And, 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 and you know, the, the, I was, put this record on to, for, with Grant today. I said, it's a friend of mine. Uh, Rob knows them. Um, she's, she puts music to scripture. Mm -hmm. So you're actually, when you're, you're singing, you're singing scriptures, you're not singing anything. And, and, and it says, without faith, it's impossible to please God, you mm -hmm. know, but you've got to believe that he is, you know yeah. what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it, it's a faith walk, and, but, yeah. you know, you've had that burden, the ministry, your hearts for the ministry, your hearts for the word of God. Mm -hmm. That's being pulled. So what does the enemy do? Oh, no, Jack, I'll give you this. I'll give you yeah. this. Yeah. Yeah. So that's really going to put you in the battle of where to go. Yeah. Well, so I think you stand on where God's, what the word God said. Yeah. And you simply wait because it says those who wait upon the Lord shall rise up as eagles. Oh, so it is that way. No, thank you. And thank don't you, Sonia. allow the enemy mm. voices. Yeah, but you know you've got a mortgage. Yeah, but you know you need to make a provision. Yeah. Don't listen to the enemy voices. Mm. You actually just listen to him. Oh, and he's obviously spoken so audibly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, definitely, hundred percent. Yeah, I mean you know no, it's thank an you, audible yeah. voice. Yeah, I, I would say so. Um, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll, we'll have one more and then we'll just continue on the part. Go on, sister. Speaking about confirmations, mm -hmm. it's interesting. Um, I'm not writing off confirmations or anything. I, mm -hmm. I know the Father does speak through confirmations. Yeah. There's Because you've got to constantly keep praying for mm -hmm. confirmations and discern it. Yeah. There was one point in my life where I was planning on going somewhere and it wasn't the right place. There was wrong influence. Mm -hmm. And this was way before I got into Torah. I had a few confirmations from charismatic Pentecostal yeah. movement about going to this. It was a supernatural school of ministry um, with Bethel. And I, and the father, and I thought it, I had a few confirmations on it. I knew I was going. And then I had to do a long fast. And mm. the father was convicting me of this. And, yeah. and what I'm trying to say is there are, there is, the enemy can use um, confirmations, yeah. counterfeit confirmations. So it's yeah. always worthwhile to test every confirmation, mm. pray about it, and even fast on them. Yeah, I would agree. I just, definitely. I just thought to share this. It's just yeah. been on my heart. Mm. Sorry, Jack. I know you yeah. want to carry yeah, on, yeah. but it will come up again. Mm -hmm. It's like Proverbs fifteen twenty two. Without counsel, plans go awry, mm. but in a multitude of counselors, mm. they are established. Yeah. And then um, Proverbs eleven. 14. Where there is no counsel, the people fall, but in a multitude of counsellors, there is safety. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, Amen. you know, in all circumstances, that's what I would say get yeah. take counsel. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah brilliant. It, it speaks about a credible witness. So, yeah. Yeah. if you're looking for confirmation and you see 11111 on your phone, you're like, God, yeah. just that confirmation on yeah. this. 
it's like no it's got to be a credible witness yeah. oh, man. Mm-hmm. them that are operating in the spirit don't just see a registration plate and think yeah oh yeah you know i've got to pursue it it just said mm-hmm. w1n oh i'm a winner look yeah. see oh, i've seen it the lord sent oh, confirmation <laughs> it's like no seek them who are operating in the spirit yeah i'd agree and as you say the council which are them who were established established in eldership that are going to give that righteous it's counsel. got to be a righteous council hasn't it it's, it's a big subject i know and it's a beautiful subject um you know it really is yeah. and I, you know i just want to reassure everyone in the room you know i did pray about this my brother was doing a seven day fast praying for me um, i was in the word about this and and yeah our, our sister's right you know you don't want to do it where you're putting yourself uh, others in, in in a position of where you have to depend on them and putting them in financial debt Praise Yah, um, you know, I'm, I'm not in that position. And, and like Abraham, when he left, he had 500 souls to take care of. Yeah. But God made him a wealthy man before he went. Mm-hmm. Before the disciples came into full-time ministry, what did Yeshua do? He, he gave them loads of fish yeah. to pay off all the debts yeah. and, to, and to secure the family. Yeah. So it is, it, it is a case by case. And this is the beauty of the spirit. It's a relationship. Mm-hmm. We, can't, we can't contain the spirit into a formula. I can't go, this is the formula in my life. I'm going to put it in your life. Callum, do it. You just can't. You can't because it's case by case, the spirit, and you've got to put it. You've got to put it to the word. You really have. And like, and like, and like Andy said, you know, it's credible witnesses, um, counsel, and 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 making sure it's based on the word. Um, and, and remember, everyone, remember, whenever you're about to step out in faith with ministry work, Satan is going to come and distract you. And this is how I felt with my job. I was like, Father, I'm dedicating myself more to the ministry. And what happens? A great prospect comes along for me. We're going to read it now in Matthew 4. Um, this is by no means the same level of temptation what I had, but it hopefully gives you an insight. It's going to step into ministry. Let's see what's offered. Matthew four, and this is something we're gonna. This is something we're gonna be fighting with to the end. This is why we have to pray for the helmet of salvation. This is why the priests had the turban with with, with written on the on on the turban, holiness to the Lord, because they want to capture every vain thought. Mm-hmm. They want to make sure it's based in His will. So this is Matthew four, and it says, "Then Yeshua was led to the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil." After fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. The tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, tell these stones to become bread. But Yeshua answered, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. Mm -hmm. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you. And they will lift up you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Yeshua replied, It is also written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed them all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. All this I will give to you, he said, if you will fall down and worship me. Away from me, Satan, Yeshua declared, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. Then the devil left him. And the angels came and ministered to him. So we see here, any time you step into ministry work, you are going to be tempted. We see it with Abraham. You know, we see it with, with, with his wife, Sarah. He got tempted by, she got tempted by Pharaoh, didn't she? Yeah. You know, be, be my husband, come, come to Egypt. Any time you're about to step into ministry work. And, and for me, when I, when, I, when, I, um, when I made the decision of not going for this position, um, I, I was like, Father, I just had a complete peace about it. All the chaos inside me. I just had a supernatural shalom. And I went into work that day and I was like, I'm sorry, I can't take this position. I've got to focus on the fellowship, on the ministry, on the calling that God has for me. And in that day, I was just on the shop floor. And this customer, an old guy, about 81, he comes to the front of the shop and he walks in. And, um, you know, everyone's, everyone's been saying to me all day, what are you going to do for money? You're going to be skint. You're going to be broke. Well, who's going to look after you? Who's going to pay your bills? I'm just saying, seek first the kingdom of God. Everything else will be added unto you. Amen. Use oh, last chance saloon and in work to preach the gospel, holding that, going, go, going all out. There's nothing left. There's no ammo left. And this old fella comes in and he goes, he's, he's talking to me, saying, can I have a top up, please? And yeah, yeah, okay, £10 top up. 
I'm speaking to him, how's your day, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, I've just interviewed you, you know. I go, what? He goes, I've just interviewed you and you don't even know it. I go, what do you mean you've just interviewed me? He goes, um, you're not good enough for this place. You know that? And I go, well, it's funny you say that, mate. I've just said to me, boss, I'm not coming back. And he was like, well, funny enough, I was in your exact same shoes when I was in my 20s. And I went into me, I felt like I had to leave. I went into the office and I seen people around me who've been there for 40 years and I handed him me notice. And he all said, why are you leaving? It's a great pension, it's this, it's that, it's this. And he said, no, I've had enough. And he said, son, it was the best decision I've ever made. Uh-huh. And I was just like, hallelujah. Well, here we go. If that's, if that's not some peace of mind, yeah. then there you go. And I've worked for the company for five years. And in the, space of, in the space of two weeks, I've had two people come up to me, never before, and, and, and speak this into my life. So for me, it was confirmation uh, by, the, by the father. After the fact, I've done it. Oh, not confirmation, comfort is probably the right, right word. Again, confirmation, you want it to come from righteous people, your counsel. It was more comfort. I felt it was the father speaking through him. Um, so Moses listened to all what commanded, what God had commanded him regarding the tabernacle. The reward for obedience is, does anyone know what the, re- of the reward for obedience is? It's God's presence. It's his peace. It's what we're going to read right now. Once all the pieces come together, once they've all been obedient to the Lord, what happens? Let's, let's read the last little bit of chunk of the Parsha and then uh, we'll wrap up for today. And it's from chapter 40, verse 34. And I've loved the input. I've loved the conversations. We'll keep going after this. Yeah. It's, 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 a big, it's a big subject, one for the podcast for sure. Um, so chapter 40, Exodus, verse 34. And it's titled in the New King James, The Cloud and the Glory. Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it and the glory of the Lord filled with the tabernacle. Whenever the Lord was taken up from above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go on in all their journeys, but the cloud was not taken up. Then they did not journey till the day. For the cloud of the Lord was above the tabernacle by day and fire was over it by night in the sight of all the house of Israel all their journeys Amen. hallelujah so that ends with the book of exodus and and just there what is the reward of obedience they had god's presence didn't they in the camp what else did they have they had god's direction mm-hmm. they had the pillar to guide them through in the night and, and and when it when it would lift up it was time to to pack up camp and move and what else was that was that was that pillar of cloud it was protection as well wasn't it from the sun from the rays of the desert and um, so so once we step into his obedience that's that's when we start seeing um, God's presence manifest in our lives. So let us all count the cost to building this assembly, to build this tabernacle. You know, what do we have to do in our personal journeys to get closer to God? I'm not saying to everyone here, give up your job. It has to be case by case. And if the Father speaks to you. Um, But we do want to be like a Book of Acts church. And I believe we are. I believe we are in this room, seriously. We we, we all want to be one mind and one accord And that is when we're going to see the presence of God move through this camp. It's the only way. It is the only way. And um, we're just going to end now on on Acts chapter 232. Because I I like how we see the the tabernacle being constructed and completed. And then we just see in in, in the book of Acts, we see the completion of the church. And and, and, and the, the early church it is of everyone coming together with one accord. So it's Acts 4, 32. The multitudes of believers was one in heart and soul. No one claimed that any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they owned. With great power, the apostle continued to give their testimonies about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. There were no needy ones among them, Because those who owned lands or houses would sell their property, bring the proceeds from the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet for distribution to anyone as he had need. Joseph, a Levite from um, Cyprus, whom the apostles called Barnabas, meaning son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. The multitude of believers was one in heart and soul. 
No one claimed any of his possessions was his own, but they shared everything they owned. With great power, the apostles continued to give their testimony about the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And abundant grace was upon them all. There was no needy ones among them, because those who owned lands or houses would sell their property, bring the proceeds from the sales and lay them at the apostles' feet for the distribution to anyone as he had need. What does that sound like? It sounds like the tabernacle, doesn't yeah. it? The laying things, the, yeah. the coming together. Yeah. Joseph, a Levite from Cyprus, of all people, whom the apostles called Barnabas, meaning son of encouragement, sold the field he owned, brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet. As we end on Exodus and go into Leviticus, I wanted to end with Joseph, who was a Levite, who sold the field he owned and contributed it to the early church. You know, we see this here, the priests in service. And I think this is how we have to be. This is, there's no other way. If we want to see miracles, if we want to see healings, if we want to even see resurrection of the dead, we all need to be in heart, in, in, in one mind and heart. And so and sometimes that does mean stepping out in faith. And it, 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 sometimes that is, can be, um, it can be completely illogical, but we don't walk um, by sight, we walk by faith. So with that, we'll uh, we'll come to an end with the book of Exodus and we will just open up um, discussion. I'm sure um, a few people want to share as well about all of that. So we'll, we'll end it there, everyone. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Shabbat shalom. Bless, you. Bless you, Jack.